Coming up on Tech News Weekly, we've got full reviews of the iPhone XS and the Apple Watch 4, a surprise Amazon announcement with a ton of new Echo hardware, how tablet and smartphone culture is affecting children's eye and ear health, and the impact of fitness bans on the insurance industry. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 50, recorded Thursday, September 20th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash tnw. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where every single week we talk to the most important people breaking and making the tech news. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Yes, every single week there's something to talk about. It's kind of amazing. It is amazing. And and you you wake up in the morning and you're like, today's just another day. And then you realize, oh, no, it isn't. Amazon had a surprise announcement, mm -hmm. a surprise event, actually, even further than just an announcement. This took a lot of coordination. Uh, surprise, Amazon decided to hold a hardware event in Seattle this morning, similar to its surprise hardware event in September of last year. So apparently it's now an official Amazon thing. A whole slew of new Echo devices were showcased on stage for reporters, and CNET's Ben Fox Rubin was there to take it all in, and he joins us now. Welcome to the show, Ben. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> it's great to have you back. So, uh, obviously, for the press anyways, how much of a surprise was this event, really? Because there sure were a lot of people there to cover it. <laughs> Wait, you mean, no, it wasn't a surprise for us at all. It was just the joke of it was, was that the embargo was embargoed. So next year, they're going to have like a turducken embargo where they're going to throw the embargo embargo. <laughs> so everybody knew about it but us. Uh, although although we were seeing lots of leaks, and that maybe it's best to start there. There were some leaks of new hardware that kind of was making the rounds. The Echo Sub, the Echo Smart Plug, which I would argue maybe weren't the top priority uh, announcements of the day, but we'll start there because everybody already knows about them. What did you think of those in, in person? Yeah, the thing that struck me that was most interesting about the sub and the smart plug were that uh, Alexa partners already make those devices. So Sonos makes a subwoofer that utilizes Alexa and TP-Link and I believe a, a handful of others already make a smart plug. So I talked to David Limp, who is the hardware chief here at Amazon, and I said, hey, what gives you convinced folks to use Alexa, and now uh, you're you're basically going to compete with them with these other devices. And he said, "No, that's not really it. Like we're trying to create like some sort of guiding star uh, for other hardware designers to keep pushing themselves forward." So they they claim that they're going to lead the way. And he even said, "Like, look, if a couple of years down the road we don't make a smart plug anymore, uh, that would be just fine with me." So we'll see if that ends up happening. So maybe we shouldn't buy their smart plug because if they're going to give it up in a couple of years, does that mean they're going to st stop supporting it? I, I No, absolutely not. And um, yeah, I definitely think it's like it's priced well at $25. But if you use the one from TP-Link, I'm sure it's just as good. And, um, you know, we'll see what additional features this thing adds in to actually make it a little bit better or try to push things a little bit further along. Do we expect that any of these devices, like the smart plug, would have HomeKit support, or is that just like something that we could never imagine? Time is good. Oh man, wow, that's that's an interesting question. No, I, <laughs> I would probably say that's that's a hard no right there, and um, I would definitely say, as far as like any sort of Google Assistant integrations, there's really no way that would happen at this point. I mean, uh, the Google. Amazon spat has been going on for quite some time now, and uh, it seems very unlikely that Amazon would ever integrate any sort of Google stuff into their products related to the Assistant especially. So then why would I get the smart plug when I, my, my Wemo smart plug works with uh, home with, with HomeKit? Uh, oh, that's with a, that's a good point. But it's okay. ex more expensive. Fair it's more expensive, enough. though. Yeah. I Okay. So that's, that's fair. Maybe with a smart plug, I suppose it's possible that it would do some sort of HomeKit integration. I would have a hard time believing that they would do that with Google Assistant or whatever, you know, Google platforms would be available for smart home. So 
Um, I, I don't like they just announced like 70 different products and features. So I don't know 100 percent about all of these, but it is I, I can see how it might be possible for something like a smart plug where you would utilize it in a variety of different ways than, you know, an echo speaker where Amazon is trying to get it, you to use it exclusively with Alexa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, we got the, the sub, the smart plug, I, I would say one of the kind of main devices would be the echo dot refresh. Um, echo dot is definitely one of the, if not the most popular, uh, echo device that Amazon sells. So this got an update. How did it sound to you? What did you think? I thought it was really cool. I mean, my feeling on the Echo Dot was that the sound is quite tinny. I also have a Google Home Mini, and the Google Home Mini sounds better. It looks better. So it was really about time that they did actually improve the Echo Dot. I think the last time they did update it was in October 2016. So, uh, and this is this is by far their most popular Echo product. It's about 50 percent. It's about 50%, according to researchers, of total Echo sales. So getting more people excited and interested about the Dot is really important for Amazon. Now, are people going to update their existing Echo Dots? I have a hard time believing that that would actually be the case. But if they significantly improve audio and it looks better, hey, it's possible. Well, I feel like we should talk about what they didn't announce. There's so much stuff. Like, was there anything yeah, they, they missed? They covered everything. They um, didn't have a bicycle. Yeah, the original, so like the Echo, like the 80, I think it's the 80 no, or true. $100, like the, just like the standard Echo, uh, because it's already encased in fabric. That's what they did with a bunch of their devices this year with the Echo Plus and the Echo Dot. Uh, so that one was already updated last year and it looks nice, which is what they were trying to do with these other products. So that was like one of the only things that they didn't announce that was an update. And so um, what about the browser in the Echo Show? I mean, that was the big, the big thing with the Echo Show is when we got it, we were promised we could watch YouTube and then they got in, <laughs> you know, a, a tussle with YouTube about it. And now you can't watch YouTube. And, um, but with the browser on the Echo Show, could I browse to YouTube? Great question. <laughs> and the answer is yes, you can. So with the new Echo Show, I talked specifically with the hardware chief, Dave Limp, about this. He confirmed that you'll be able to go to websites, including YouTube. Like, it's a web browser. You can go to any website. So uh, that basically means YouTube will be get back-ended into the new Echo Show. And good news for anybody that has the old Echo Show, when the new ones do get released, the old Echo Shows will also get this browser. So mm. I, I think that's super useful, and that's obviously something that's been really a problem for the Echo Show. It, it, just like you said, that it was something that was promised that Google ended up, you know, pulling support for. for. So we'll see. The Echo Spot still doesn't have it, but we'll see what Amazon decides to do with that. Meanwhile, these these uh, home assistants with screens, like the, the home, the, the Google version of this has YouTube kind of embedded into the experience. And that's the thing I don't want because mm -hmm. my kids will not be able to uh, be, be able to hold themselves back from, you know, playing YouTube videos all the time. So not having that YouTube capability actually sounds really, really nice to me. Um, <laughs> so what about the larger Echo Plus? That got an update. It sounds like improved mm -hmm. sound. Uh, what did you think there? Yeah, it, it looks a little bit nicer than the previous one. I am a little disappointed a little disappointed that like the original Pringles can shape is now non-existent from the line because that was continued with the Echo Plus last year. Now they've moved on the Echo Plus to a more fabricy, a little bit nicer, softer look. So the original, like the OG Echo look is no longer there, which is too bad because that's what a lot of people know of the Echo. That's how it was first introduced to people. Um, but yeah, it, it looks like it's got better audio. It looks like it's going to fit in more places in your house a little bit nicer. So I, I, I think they did what they what, what was smart, or what they should have done with that product. Now you just said Echo Look, and you meant like the look of the Echo. But a product that we haven't heard oh, yes. anything about is the Echo Look, which um, was was announced to a lot of suspicion, like a lot of people like me saying, "I love Amazon Echoes, and I have my room, my whole house blanketed with them, but not in my closet and not in my bedroom, and that's just creepy." And so I haven't heard anything more about it. Um, have you? I mean, they're still selling it. I think it's about $200 on their website. I don't know how well it's selling because basically you've got the Echo Dot and then probably like the standard Echo. And then I would imagine a lot of the other products are 
much weaker sellers, like they're much lower down. Uh, so I'm not sure how well the Echo look sells, but yeah, that was another one that they didn't really mention that much. A lot of people were very suspicious about it when it came out. They were uncomfortable with the idea of the camera. So I, I don't know if they're going to emphasize it as much. There's certain hardware pieces of hardware from this announcement, especially because there was tons of announcements uh, in a very short amount of time that make perfect sense. A lot of what we've talked about makes perfect sense. Uh, the look might fall into the category of some of these other like didn't see that coming pieces of hardware. The Echo wall clock, the uh, a voice enabled Amazon Basics microwave, which doesn't carry the Echo branding. These were kind of like almost like, you know, throw a dart at the wall and be like, yeah, sure, we'll. Oh yeah, we'll make a microwave. Sure, we'll do that. Uh, but what do you think about these? Because these are these are really kind of going in different directions. Obviously, Amazon really wants to bring Echo to everything <laughs> under the moon. But uh, what do you think about these? Okay, so I'm currently in Amazon's headquarters, but I, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I think the wall clock is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, they don't like yank me out of here for saying that. But <laughs> I no, I didn't you. see it coming. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see it coming, and I don't think it really like does a whole lot. It like helps show you timers, and it is another way for Amazon to like emphasize like, hey, we can have Alexa integrate with everything, including your wall clock. But at the same time, like, I don't see myself buying it anytime yeah. soon. Uh, the microwave is kind of fun because microwaves are not sexy. And the idea of like having an Alexa integrated microwave, that one seems to be getting some buzzy attention. Um, it was it was leaked out earlier this week and a lot of people were like, what the hell? Like, that seems really strange. But I, I think the microwave, I'm not really sure if it's going to sell really well, but it's only $60 and it does sound yeah, like an expensive. interesting concept. Yeah. I've been thinking about the clock and I think the clock is secretly brilliant because I think there's something about having um, having these devices built in, sort of built into your home. Um, and the fact that like a clock is, you know, it's like it's high end to have like a big wall panel where you can just control stuff. And I feel like that's where they're aiming, but it's only $30. And so it's such a low pr price point. You can imagine giving it as gifts. And I don't know, I just think that it's going to be a big seller but uh, I could be totally wrong. It, it could be. You know, one of the selling points was um, they mentioned on stage that you don't have to reset your wall clock for daylight savings time, but I, I would I would very enthusiastically complain that, you know, they failed to mention that daylight savings time is the most horrible thing ever. So <laughs> I, I, will, I will change those clocks on my own mm -hmm. just to remind myself how awful daylight savings is. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Someday they'll get rid of it and that won't be a selling point anymore. Uh, yeah. So obviously lots of hardware, but there were also some software announcements, um, the underlying software that's powering the Echo hardware. Uh, there's, there were some announcements on kids features, stereo pairing, multi-room support, Alexa Guard. I mean, probably too many to, to dive into, but what were a couple of, of your key points from those favorites? So as you mentioned, Alexa Guard is a really interesting one, actually. It's if you turn on this feature, basically your Alexa operates as kind of like a protective service in your home. And from what I understood, it was just free. You don't have to buy a new Echo or anything like that. And your Echo will send you little audio clips if it hears um, like the CO or the smoke alarm going off in your house or if it hears glass breaking. It seems like a really clever concept. And if you integrate it with Ring, then it's possible that you would be able to actually get, you know, authorities involved or, you know, get the police to your house if you if uh, need be. So uh, to me, that sounded like a pretty interesting concept. And it, it, it was a continuation of their integration with Ring, which it, their whole emphasis is trying to make neighborhoods safer. Yeah, I think uh, part of that that I really like, I would love to integrate. We have Google Home in our house is that randomized lighting feature so that if you're going yeah, away, activate cool. that and it turns on different lights throughout your home at random times to kind of make it look like there's movement and everything. That's really, I, I love that. It's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, the thing I also, the thing I liked also about this whole concept was is that you don't have to buy a new one and uh, yeah. to, to like actually use it, which, which I think is like really important for tech companies to do and it kind of like adds to the trust uh, of, 
of consumers when they buy this stuff, that it's not, they're not just like creating it and then they're going to make it obsolete and force you to buy the new one in a year or two. So I, I, I thought that was a pretty nice concept that they came out with. Absolutely. Well, you guys did a great job of covering this. Uh, tons of content to read up if you, because we've definitely not talked about every single announcement that Amazon had this morning at their surprise event. Uh, but definitely go to CNET.com. Check out uh, the, the fine work of, of Ben's and, and all of your colleagues as well. Ben Fox Rubin uh, with CNET, CNET.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. We appreciate Thank it. You. We'll talk to you soon. So a few years ago, right before my daughter started high school, she started complaining of headaches and she couldn't see the board uh, from the back of the classroom. I took her to an ophthalmologist and uh, I asked the doctor, much to her chagrin, if he thought the cause of her headaches was overuse of her iPhone. Uh, the doctor, the ophthalmologist kind of laughed at me. He said, it's probably just genetics. Her dad wears glasses. She probably needs glasses. But there might be some science behind this, and I am going to prove it. And eventually, I'm going to prove that I'm wrong, right about this. Joining us to talk about the possible dangers to children's hearing and eyesights from uh, from technology is Julia Calderon, science writer for <laughs> Consumer Reports. Hi, Megan. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, and welcome to the show. But first things first, was I right, or was the doctor uh, right, or was my daughter right? <laughs> well, it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, I think researchers are looking into this very, um, you know, they, they want to know how technology is affecting vision. And it is pretty clear that, you know, these close work activities, reading things, screens, tablets, iPads, um, even books could potentially be affecting vision. You know, it's it, they're seeing an increase in kids with nearsightedness, an increase in kids with dry eye. And, you know, it's it's not clear exactly what role technology is playing in that, but it's, they think, you know, that it might be playing some role. So you talk about near work. So is near work different on a screen than reading a book? So, no, it seems like they are both equally bad. You know, if you're reading a book versus watching an iPad or reading an ebook, it's still, you know, anything that's really close to your face is not good. And I imagine that that probably ties right into as well the the kind of advice that we hear about VR and young kids and not doing that, because even though there's this perception of depth, like it's completely fake, you, you're staring at a screen that's about this close to your eyeball. So that that probably isn't very good for them as well. I'm sure that the research didn't dive too deeply into that aspect. But no, yeah, I don't think they've really taken a close look at VR yet. But, it, you know, any screen that you're looking at it, when you're focusing on something, you're also not going to blink as much as you normally would. And so not blinking also leads to dry eye, which can over time you know, it, it can affect the lens of your eye and then that can lead to vision problems later in life. So what this really reminds me of is when I was a kid and I would sit in front of the TV set and my mom would say, hey, you know, it, it was always my mom. My, my dad apparently didn't care about this, <laughs> but my mom would say, hey, you need to sit further back from the TV. You know, it's bad for your eyes to sit close. Is, is it kind of the same thing? I mean, is this just research extended into, you know, the, the new digital age of portable devices where we're at now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, these devices haven't been around that long in the overall scheme of things, you know, like these devices have become portable relatively recently. And so researchers really don't know how that's affecting us. But yeah, no matter what you're looking at, it's going to affect your eyes. And that's why it's important to not only stand from far away, but also to take breaks. You know, the researchers are suggesting that you follow what's called the 20-20-20 rule, where if you're looking at something or reading, whatever, um, take a break every 20 minutes for 20 seconds and look at something that is at least 20 feet away. Mm, I never heard that. Um, so you're a science writer and what I love about your piece is it doesn't, you know, you're not trying to make the um, headlines like everything's horrible and it's going to give you cancer. And we've delved into this topic many times and we get, you know, and everyone has an opinion. So recently there was uh, headlines about macular degeneration being caused by blue light. What do you know about those studies? Yeah, so those headlines really were upsetting because they really did overblow the research. Uh, you know, you saw all these headlines that was like blue lights from screens cause blindness and your smartphone's going to make you go blind. 
it's not, that was a big leap for people to take. So the study that was done was done in cells. It wasn't done in humans. And so it's, it, you know, it's, it's potential that blue light is harmful and we think that it is harmful. Um, but we don't know exactly, you know, what level of exposure is going to potentially cause a problem in your eye. And it's the kind of thing that it's not going to make you go blind, you know, overnight. It's like if it does damage your eye, it's going to be something that's very slow over a long period of time. And it's something that researchers are concerned about, but it's not something that immediately is like, you know, stop using all of your screens. Yeah, we, we hear a lot about this whole blue screen, you know, uh, uh, smartphone manufacturers are building into the OS ways to kind of have a, a, a filter that reduces the, you know, air quotes, harmful color so that you can, you know, kind of balance your circadian rhythm and all this kind of stuff. On, on one hand, I totally get it on the and I totally practice it like I have my phone set up for these things. On the other hand, I couldn't point to it specifically and say, yes, it's improved things. Like, what is the science behind that that, that shows how blue light actually damages the, the retina? Yeah, and so that's actually one area that we do have pretty good research is showing that blue light can affect your body. Um, it can affect the body's production of a hormone called melatonin, which helps you fall asleep. Um, I don't know if you've heard of melatonin mm -hmm. supplements that when you take them, they help you fall asleep. Um, and so the blue light from screens, researchers are finding that it, it reduces the production of this hormone, which makes it harder for you to fall asleep. And that's actually has some pretty solid research behind it. Um, the things that you're talking about, like night shift, you know, some mm -hmm. of those apps that where it'll reduce the blue light from your iPhone or whatever. Um, there haven't actually been a lot of studies on that to show if that is really helpful in reducing the blue light. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. The best thing to do is just not look at any screen at least an hour before bed. Yeah. And what about hearing? Now, uh, when my kids go back to school, on the back to school like supplies list, it's pencils, erasers, earbuds, <laughs> because they have <laughs> iPads. So, I mean, what about using uh, earbuds and earphones? Do Should we be concerned about that with our kids? Yeah, definitely. I think also, you know, now that this technology is so portable and kids are listening, you know, in the bus, uh, in the car, on airplanes, wherever, when you're traveling, um, they're not only listening to sounds um, more than they used to, but also at potentially higher levels because, you know, there's a lot of background noise around them. So when they're listening with earbuds, one good thing is to, to get a solid pair of noise canceling earphones for them. And I know that that's hard as a parent because they're really expensive, but it will protect their hearing in the long run. Um, if you can reduce the levels of outside sounds that are coming in, they won't have to turn up the volume on their headphones as loud. But in general, you know, the rule of thumb is if they can't hear you, if they're listening to their headphones and you're talking to them and they can't hear you, that means it's too loud. Also, if you can hear the music coming from their headphones while they're listening, that also means it's too loud. And they should be taking regular breaks too. You know, there's, there's another rule called the 80-90 rule, which is that they shouldn't listen to the sound would it at 80 percent of the maximum volume on their device for more than 90 minutes a day but that could be hard to regulate you know with with a child when you're not with them all day yeah or when they're in their device and they've got the headphones on i mean it's it's unless you hear those cues you hear the audio kind of leaking through loud enough that you can actually hear it outside of the headphones it, it, barring that it's really hard to know exactly how loud it is they might just be really good sealed headphones you know and you don't hear how loud it is uh, so it's really it's really hard to know what are some of the signs to look for in children who might be negatively affected in these ways maybe the, you know from from a hearing perspective or or maybe they're they're showing signals that you know their their eyes are their, their eye health is diminishing in some way. What are some signs to look for? Yeah. So, you know, with their vision, if they are blinking a lot, if they're complaining that their eyes are dry, if they're irritable, if they're acting angry, you know, take a break, like, you know, take their device away, take their book away, whatever they're doing, take their video games away. And if it doesn't get better after a period of time, then you should take them to an eye doctor to get their eyes checked. 
with hearing, you know, if, if there's any pain or ringing or buzzing in their ears, or if you see that they're like missing parts of a conversation, or if you've found that their school performance is declining and it's, it's kind of out of the ordinary for them, then definitely you want to get their hearing checked. And, you know, they should be having regular hearing checks regardless. Mm-hmm. In your piece in Consumer Reports, you link to another piece of yours that you uh, talk about headphones specifically, and you give a lot of good advice. And and one thing you point out, which is that, I mean, if kids, I I love the idea of noise canceling headphones, but then if they're using them and walking to school or walking around, then that's not a good idea, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's actually something I, you know, I think for adults, it might be a little bit different. Um, I asked a researcher about this. I was like, is it dangerous to walk around in a city with noise canceling headphones on? And he was like, well, you know, if they're they're going to get hit by a car, you know, with their headphones on there, they'll probably get hit by a car anyways. You know, it's probably not the headphones fault. But I think for a kid, it's probably a good idea to be more aware of their surroundings. They should definitely not wear them when they're riding a bike or, you know, doing anything where they're going really fast and they can, you know, really hurt themselves. So, yeah, good to be aware of their surroundings. Well, Julia, thank you so much for joining us. Julia Calderon is a science writer for Consumer Reports. Her work has been featured in Scientific American, Scientific American Mind, Reuters, and more. And uh, she says she's most happy when reporting on microbes. Aren't we all? (laughs) (laughs) Microbes are the best. (laughs) You can find out more at juliacalderon.com and read all her pieces at uh, consumerreports.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. This was fun. Take care. <laughs> Take care. All right. Up next, we'll get Renee Ritchie's firsthand perspective on the iPhone XS and the Apple Watch 4, Series 4. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean provides the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications with droplets, virtual machines that are scalable compute platform with add-on storage, security, and monitoring capabilities. Uh, You can choose from standard or CPU optimized droplets and customize from there. A DigitalOcean is designed for developers, so it has an easy to use control panel and an API that lets developers spend more time coding and then less time managing their infrastructure. Industry leading price to performance, access the compute resources that you need at the lowest rates, saving up to 55% compared to the other cloud providers. And you'll always know what you'll pay per month with a flat pricing structure across all data center regions. Included at no additional cost, you get a whole bunch of stuff. 99.99% uptime SLA, uh, cloud firewalls, monitoring and alerting, full DNS management, global data centers, enterprise SSDs, easy to use API. Over 150,000 businesses, including some of the world's fastest growing startups, rely on DigitalOcean and has to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry leading price performance. Uh, Sign up today and you'll receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash tnw. That's do.co slash tnw for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Tech News Weekly. If you stayed up late on ordering day or if you wake up early this Friday, you might have the chance to get your hands on the new iPhones and the Apple Watches. But if you are Renee Ritchie, then you've been using them already. You've been using them for so long, you're already getting tired of them. Welcome back to the show, Renee. Hi, thank you for having me back. <laughs> uh, I was just kidding. You're not tired of the, the phones and the watch yet, are you? No, no, you can never get tired. They're so pretty and <laughs> so gold. <laughs> there, so you got both golds? All gold, all the gold. All <laughs> Gold. Okay, so there's a lot about the 10s and the uh, t- that's similar to the 10. Um, let's start with what's different. So, I mean, the, well, there's a gold finish, which, if you're superficial like me, um, is just you know uh, a better. <laughs> Anything gold is the only acceptable color. Also, the big deal though is the processor, the A12 Bionic. It has the same name as last year because Apple is still focusing on. The things like the neural engine, but it is so much faster. They had um, a dual core neural block last year. Now they have an eight core neural engine and it's just capable of doing a whole bunch of really smart things, including deciding what it should hand off to the GPU and to the CPU. 
And so um, what what are your thoughts on the new portrait mode features? I know those are new, and um, I think I have a link in there, Josh, to Renee's Instagram selfies that show it off. W what are your thoughts on it? I mean, that stuff is neat. That's sort of like a demonstration of the computational future where you're using bits to overcome the limitation of atoms. Phone cameras are just, they don't have any Z-index, so they can't really, they can't give you the benefits of big glass. But we're using artificial intelligence to sort of overcome physics. And in this case, right now you can do it in post, but eventually, like soon, I think the fall update, you'll be able to do it live where you can, you can go from F1.4 all the way to F16 just by sliding across the little uh, bar at the bottom. What about uh, picture quality? So, I mean, obviously now on on premium smartphones, obviously the iPhones uh, fall into that category. Pictures is like one of the most important things to so many people. How does it compare to last year's ten? And then how does it compare to another powerhouse in this in this regard, the Pixel Two uh, camera? What do you think? I mean, I used to joke and say that Nokia had big glass, Apple had a really good ISP, and Google would just suck everything up to the cloud and make it look awesome. Uh -huh. um, and, and we're still seeing different approaches. Like Huawei is already throwing three cameras at it. Yeah. Google's using one really good camera, but they're using a ton of their server-based AI on it. Apple is a little bit in the middle. They're using two cameras, so you get the benefit of something like optical zoom, and you get real depth data because uh, you don't just want to use cameras for portrait modes. Developers are doing all sorts of really clever things with depth data from cameras cameras, including really advanced AR stuff. So I think you really want to give them that. I think it's better right now to have two physical cameras. Uh, it's better than the iPhone 10 in that it's better at low light. It's got a new sensor. It's got wider pixels, deeper pixels. Uh, and because of the AI engine, it's able to do a lot more. It's able to understand what you're shooting and sort of process it in a way where the compression algorithms don't get in the way of the textures and where it can do what Apple's calling smart HDR, which is where it, it takes it's doing, it's doing a buffer of four frames, two regular frames, two overexposed frames to get details in the shadows. And then when you hit the button, it's doing an, a, a long exposure to bring details out of the highlights too. So it, it's very similar to Google's approach, but instead of being cloud-based, it's based on the device. People, a lot of this is going to be subjective. I find Google's color calibration a little bit cold. Other people find Apple's a little bit warm. I guess it depends if you're shooting Canon or Nikon mm -hmm. in your previous life. Uh, but we, we're blessed to have so many really good cameras phones now absolutely renee says google leaves them a little cold that's what i heard <laughs> that could be no, a time i'm used to shooting with the canon and apple looks closer to my to my fast 50 than than the pixel does pixel looks wonderful it just looks a little bit cooler than what i'm used to yeah, yeah. so you have a pixel that you use too yeah, I have a pixel, a, a pixel 2 XL and I'll get the Pixel 3. Uh, I feel like with all the leaks, I'm the only one who doesn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as they go up for order, I'm going to get one right uh, away. You probably could have bought one for like $2,000. I think they were selling on the black market. <laughs> you, know, you could have one now too. So when you're sitting at home, um, what when do you reach for the Pixel 2? Like what what is it that um, that your many iPhones don't do that you need to reach for the Pixel? I mean, I don't. I use it just to test. I always want. Ever since the Nexus came out, I always want to make sure I have the latest Google phone, uh, just so that I can compare with it. I don't do a lot with it because I don't like to be signed into Google services. And if you don't, for example, give it permission to look at your lo your uh, app and your web usage, it just doesn't let you use Assistant. And I'm like, I I just want to open up the weather app. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, nope, nothing for you. So uh, you know, it's it's a contentious relationship. But I do like I use it for photos and I use it for gaming sometimes. And I just I I use it for Chrome and I just want to make sure I'm I'm at least keeping up to date on it. When you were talking about the A12, the Bionic uh, chip update, and of course this is the, what it was, it the se seven nanometer process yes. on this phone, which is a really big deal. How, where, do, where do those improvements surface most for you on a day-to-day -day usage scale or, or experience when you're interacting with a phone? Where do you notice those improvements most? So seven nanometer, it should be clear that a lot of this is marketing terms now, like d different vendors have different processes that they call by different sizes. But I think uh, Taiwan Semiconductor really has a very good process now where they can fit an awesome amount onto a very small area. So you have much more processing capacity in a much smaller space, and that increases efficiency. And once, you know, it's the same thing for processors as it is for race cars. The more efficient you can be, the faster you can be, because you're, the enemy here is heat, and it just, it keeps the heat down. So on a daily basis, you can do more things before the phone gets hot, before it gets stuttery, before it has to throttle down, uh, before it has to ramp down, and the, it can do many more things now. So I always judge it based on, can I do things now that I 
couldn't do before. And using photography again, for an example, I can get usable photos under worse conditions than I could previously. Mm -hmm. So it's more like I can get photos I never could before. I can play longer than I could before without noticing any lag. It's all those sort of small quality of life improvements. Sure. So, um, I am going to pick up uh, an, an X10. I called it an X. A 10. It's, that's why that, fault. it's not your fault. Yeah, no, it's that's why I spell out the word 10. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way I'm going to not do that. <laughs> so the 10s Max, I, I felt like that's the one that I needed. Um, but then it's not arriving, they think, until the 24th. Um, and Josh is going to go tomorrow morning to wait in line at a store where he thinks he's going to be able to buy one for himself and his wife will be able to buy one. And he thinks that he's going to buy me one as well. And I'm going to pay him back, obviously. But now which one? Now I'm thinking maybe I should get the smaller one. Like I, I had the 6s Plus, I had the 7 Plus, I had the 8 Plus. But I did like the smaller, but I feel like I have to, I don't know, I feel like I have to get the most expensive thing of everything, and that's probably because Leo's paying, but what do you think I need? <laughs> I think if it's Leo's paying, you should get three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, yeah, give I me mean, one. Yeah, okay. it, the screen is so much bigger. Like It fills the entire size of an iPhone 6 Plus or 7 Plus or 8 Plus that you're used to, and that's just a massive display. So I think it's for people who really, like, for example, uh, I woke up one day and I just couldn't see my iPhone with my glasses on anymore. Mm -hmm. And they have display zoom back. So if you want bigger text, bigger buttons, easier to hit, or if you just want more surface area because you want to watch all your movies or read all your books or play all your games on your iPhone. I like to joke that the iPhone XS Max is kind of like the iPhone X had a baby with an iPad mini. It really <laughs> is like a tiny tablet at that screen size. And if that appeals to you, then you want it. But if you do prefer the smaller phone, if you want to do more things one-handed, if you need it to fit into smaller pockets or bags or any thing like that, you still have a really big screen now on the iPhone 10, uh, 10 S. Sorry. I kind of think about for me to get used to that too. <laughs> I think I need both. I think I'm going to tell him that you said I needed both Renee. Well, it, comparison, right? You've got to serve the viewers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything missing, uh, from these two new phones? Uh, from the phone point, I mean, it's still it's still very opinionatedly Apple and uh, things like faster charging in the box. There's still a five watt charger in the box. And I know scientists will tell me slow and cold is the best way to charge a phone. And I'll eke three days extra battery health out of it after five years. But it's just not convenient. And they took away the 3.5 millimeter headphone adapter because it's been a couple of years, but we still don't have USB-C and that's been a couple of years as well. And I, it's a company that can spend millions of dollars making the perfect cam uh, camfered edge on a phone or the perfect lacquered finish just won't put the adapters in the box and that never never ceases to fail annoying me. Uh, so are you ready to move on to the watch? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, you also have the watch and you said it's the most yes. important product that Apple's ever made. Oh, it's so Whoa. pretty. <laughs> it's so big. Yeah, no, I really feel that way because there's tons of technology. And, you know, I say that the Apple Watch saves lives and people say the phone saves lives, computers save lives, helicopters, defibrillators, all those things save lives. And they absolutely do. But the watch has the advantage of always being connected to you. It's persistent and it has those sensors. So you don't always have your phone in your hand. And that could be as simple as like you're in an accident uh, or you fall off your bicycle while you're while you're riding in the park alone or the or the mountain alone. All of those things where the phone might go flying, the watch is still on your wrist. At night, you put it down on your on your table or you put it down in your desk at work and you walk around and it's just not connected to you. Where Apple Watch has over and over again, which is the definition of modern science, over and over again, found things like high heart rates and now it can do low heart rates and soon it's going to do irregular heart rates and soon it's going to do ECG as well. And I think when you have that sort of benefit on you, it literally becomes a life-saving device. So you're a professional, you do this for a living. Uh, <laughs> did you fall? And if so, how did it do? So I fell, but I, I did judo for a lot of, of years and I do break falls. And I was told that one of the key things about detecting falls is the movement of your arms. So they're supposed to go like, wah, if you're falling right. backwards mm -hmm. or wah, if you're falling forwards. And I keep mine like this so I can break fall. And so I totally screwed up the process. <laughs> but I only found that out after I'd done it twice on concrete. So I was, I was not tempted to run back out and do it again. Oh. Are, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. It was okay. mostly the rain. I just got soaking wet after doing it twice. And then I was like, that's okay. enough. Do you have access to a trampoline? Yeah, I'm interested though because it's the it's measuring the rapid deceleration right. of a body hitting something hard. I think a trampoline will do some sort of inertial dampening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we can we can it's gonna be fun to test. Well, it's a huge bummer because on Monday um, of this week I fell on my hand. I don't know if you oh, can no. see it. Um, and it's all swelled up. You can sort of yeah. see how swelled up it is. Oh, yeah. I fell. I was running. I fell and like on my fingers and. Oof. 
you're reminded at how, and my shoulder, my head, you're reminded it as how, like that's a shocking specific movement to fall like head over heels on, you know, on the ground. It's, yeah. Yeah. it you feel it. And uh, it would be very hard to, I think, um, fake that in any way. Um, but. Yeah. Which, which makes me wonder how they tested it and got it to the point that they did. If it had to be a true, like actual fall. I don't want to say it was on the air power team, Jason, but it might have been on the air power team. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what the air power is? No, I'm just going to laugh, though. (laughs) (laughs) The air power was the thing that they announced but then never came out that you can... um, uh, put your watch and your um, phone. Oh, the, that the, from the, from the last, last year. year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it's, See, it was so long ago, I forgot that yeah. it actually had a name. <laughs> no, but so. I'm going to buy, I had a couple relatives, elderly relatives who fell and that was basically the end for them, the decline. They just never recovered after falling and it, yeah. they lived alone, took a while for someone to find them, then they were hospitalized and it just got, and if, if there's, even me or, you know, or friends of mine who go mountain biking alone, just a piece of, like, maybe it won't work every time, but 80%, 70%, those odds to me are so worth getting a piece of technology and slapping on your wrist that it it is absolutely going to be the the Christmas gift I give out this year. Yeah. And and you know a lot of people have been saying well now it's going to call 911 all the time and um and Adam Angst was on Mac Break Weekly um I uh, got to fill in for you Renee this week oh. and <laughs> um he made a good point which is took cuz he had just fallen also on his bike and he made the good point is as an adult um, when you fall and you actually can get up, that's the first thing you do. Like you just get up, you look around yeah. and someone see me like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Even if you're like in total pain. So like that is the natural response when you fall down. If you can get up, you do immediately. You don't just lie there. Um, your instincts yeah. are to get up, I think. And it's a minute. I mean, you've got to really want to get, yeah. you know, you've got to really be hurt to stay there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So um, I think I, 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 I like the idea. Um, now, how often do you use the cellular? Did you get the, do you have the cellular now? I do, um, and I got a cellular series for uh, there. I'm, I use it, but it's. I have. This is a long story. Rogers, the carrier that I use, never implemented the kind of networking you needed for Apple Watch. They're doing it this year finally, so I had to use a different carrier to use my Apple Watch, and I didn't get as good service at home, so I would switch back and forth pairing it to different phones. I only ever had it half the time. Uh, as soon as that goes live, I think it's going live tomorrow. I'm going to just have it on all the time. And I love the idea that, you know, it cannot replace your phone, but you can do a lot of brief, important things with it. You can, I could go out shopping now at this point with Apple Pay and with cellular and with all of these services. And I did use walkie talkie when, when I was out at Pokemon Go Fest, just press the button. Hey, where are you? Oh, down by the stand. Okay. I'll be right there. Um, and it's a weird feeling. It's like push to talk on the old Nextel phones. Yeah. But for some things, it just it just feels like a more convenient way to do it. Uh, would you say this is enough of an upgrade from the three to make the jump if someone has the three? What do you think? Normally, I would not. Like, it is a redesign, and some people just love redesigns. But by the core feature set, you're getting so much with the watchOS 5 update that you don't need to run out to get it. But because it is such a health-focused device, if the ECG, if you're in the U.S. especially, and the ECG appeals to you, if the uh, the fall detection appeals to you because that's unique to Series 4. So if you have any condition where you think this would be either safe or potentially life-saving, then I would say it's worth a couple hundred bucks to do it. Mm-hmm. So what what's missing on the Apple Watch? This on the series. Uh, always on time. It is still a watch that fails most of the time at being a watch, and I can't believe five. Years. I understand battery is expensive. You know, you pay for everything in mobile with battery life, but I would be willing to give up on something else to have a little bit of always on time. Also sleep tracking. I know you can get apps for that, but I always like there to be a baseline of Apple service because then it starts to permeate the mainstream culture. And I think sleep tracking is hugely important. Um, And then it's just, you know, it's just a matter of time. We'll get more and more features until we'll be pulling it over our hand like Tony Stark and blasting people. (laughs) Well, Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Renee Ritchie is the host of Vector at iMore, MacBreak Weekly here at Twit, and Nihi is Renee Ritchie on Twitter and Instagram, where you can see all the links and all the pictures that he's taken and all of his reviews of these products. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Take care. We'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Finally, and this is totally related, actually, fitness trackers, they're cool and all, but uh, you had to know this was coming. John Hancock, which is the largest and oldest life insurer here in the U.S., It's going to take its interactive life insurance policy that it first unveiled in 2015, I guess it tested a single policy then, and apply it to all policies that it covers going forward. What does that mean? That means if you have a policy through them, 
you get you, you get as a kind of a reward, a premium, a, a discounts, gift card awards, that sort of stuff, other perks for using your fitness bands and then reporting the data to them. And then, of course, along with that, hitting your health and your exercise targets uh, within that data. So policyholders are incentivized also because the people that they're covering uh, with their insurance live healthier lives. And John Hancock then ultimately pays uh, less in claims as its clients live longer, healthier lives. But of course, there's a flip side here because a lot of pe people are getting up in arms about this as well. Privacy advocates say this moves us further into a world where our private health data is shared with companies like John Hancock uh, and potentially other insurance companies who would someday choose to cancel a plan, maybe not cover certain incidents based on a historical stream of unfiltered data coming from these devices that you're wearing all the time, reporting all that data. Uh, if you wish to get your insurance through John Hancock, you must agree to some level of fitness tracking. And that has some people concerned about where that leads. What do you think? Because I I don't wear these devices. And even when I do, I don't really do a whole lot of fitness tracking. So I'm curious to hear what you say. Uh, I feel like it seems a little bit invasive. Like I don't, um, I, I mean, part of me is like, oh, well, I would like uh, to get those special features for exercising. I, you know, uh -huh. I do, I do a lot. Um, you already exercise. So yeah. You might as well get right? a, a exactly. premium discount yeah, and that's not, gift cards. That's, and... Yeah, um, but that I, it, it de definitely feels creepy. The other thing is it says, you know, if you reach your goals, you'll get these um, discounts and, and uh, gift cards. But with the Apple Watch, I can set whatever goal I want. So like, yeah. what if I set it really low? Josh, for example, his goal is very low. I know because we follow each other, but his, mine's like 600, his like 100. Like he just has very <laughs> Throwing low. Throwing Josh under the bus. <laughs> wow. The bus is rolling over Josh right now. It's true though, Josh. That's what it recommends my goal is though. I didn't choose it. <laughs> Are you sure? You can set yeah, it higher. I know. I know, but it cho it, cho it chose it for me. It suggested like 180. <laughs> the, the wand chooses the wizard is what you're saying. Um, couldn't, yes. couldn't you just like put your watch in, in like a, a shoe and then throw it in the dryer and then tumble it around on like, and you know, every day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or just set your goal very low. That's just what I'm saying. Well, they, I, I would imagine that they probably have some sort of insight into what your goal should be. Otherwise it's like, right. yeah, sure. I'll do this. Yeah. Uh, five steps. Mm -hmm. I, I reached it, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but I, I'm sure there will be people that game this sort of thing too, or maybe they already have, because apparently they've had this going since 2015 in a single policy. But um, I think that the concern that people have is if this becomes an industry trend, is this the beginning of more insurance, you know, companies kind of moving in this direction, requiring this data stream mm -hmm. Uh, that that tracks you that, you know, and, and then other people are saying, well, you know what, you you vote with your dollars. And if you don't want it, go with another insurance carrier because right. there are a lot of them out there. But but then the bigger concern is that we'll turn into Gattaca, like where only right. the healthy people get jobs and only the healthy people can, you know, um, do oh, things. And <laughs> you mean you mean it would turn into China where we have some sort of social rating system that I mean, this is this stuff is happening. There was actually a really fascinating article can't remember what site it was on. It was a. Uh, it was posted yesterday, but well worth seeking out. That's all about the the Chinese kind of social credit system, mm -hmm. and I mean all this stuff. It like it it really does intertwine, and you can see through moves like this, the direction that it's kind of heading. Like there's there's a lot of this stuff happening. Yes, in in China, uh, and that feels distant enough mm -hmm. to let's say Americans, but. Things like this kind of touch touch their their toes in the water of that stuff, and you can see it kind of heading there. And I mm -hmm. think that makes a lot of people uneasy. Right, and it's disturbing when you really think about how life insurance works. Like they really want you to keep you alive, so you keep paying. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's the only it really reason. is a gamble. Yeah. At the end of the day. <laughs> Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. If you want to catch us live, you can do it there. You can also be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. If you want to subscribe to our show, go to twit.tv slash TNW. And if you want to tweet at me, telling me how I can uh, detect my own falls without hurting myself again, I'm at Megan Maroney. <laughs> and I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to Josh. Thanks to everyone who helps. Uh, Jammer B was in here earlier. Uh, helps us do this show each and every week. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week on another episode of Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Don't use that hand. Don't use that hand.